Hello and welcome again to the Hobo and His Girlfriend Wrestling Podcast. My name is the one and only Hobo Tom. That volume's a little too loud. There we go. That sounds better. I have it up there so I could listen while I was cooking. In the bathroom, I gotta play with this volume a little bit. I'm doing my laundry and also I'm wearing my Steve Fern Larson shirt. Well, my friend though shirt. Yeah, and it's time to talk about wrestling. You know, talking about wrestling, you should always wear your wrestling t-shirt. And any ladies, you go to a wrestling match with this guy, you will get your own wrestling t-shirt. At least be that gentlemanly like. And we're coming off the heels of a really good show at Ring of Honor. And again, I just want to send in one more shout out because he actually left a comment. Saint 308, thank you very much for your comments. This OMG moment goes out for you. Let's talk about some WWE for a change. Let's just change gears from indie shows to more mainstream. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Enjoy my big breakfast. I have my very fancy watermelon and bourbon drink. Ooh. Have to treat yourself every so often to something tasty. So let's talk about the real TLC. The tables, ladders, and chairs by WWE. This was a weird show. I think WWE has the right idea on what to do. I think one major problem that they have is that they they there's there's too many bookers. I think I think that's really screwing up stuff. Overall, the table, ladders, and chairs was actually pretty darn entertaining. Especially the second half of it. Which is weird because the second half was mainly SmackDown stars. Wait a second. Is there a correlation here? Raw bad, SmackDown good. Who knows? Well, let's get to the, the main part of the show. Um, I think my only gripe, really, with WWE pay-per-views nowadays is that the pre-show is so long. And they only have two matches in a half-hour time span. Granted, that Becky Lynch promo at the end was really good. Becky, am I a lose face, though? Let's talk about the show itself. Yeah, and I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Again, you can always comment so you don't know what you're talking about, Hobo Tom. Go back to hoboing. Go back on the street and collect your aluminum. Or you can say, wow, you're right. How does a hobo know all this stuff? Well, let's start off with the pre-show. And this is what I mean by WWE. Oh, um, to, uh, to start off. Well, well, I'll get to that in the end, actually. But I was a 50-50 booker. means... I actually picked six out of the potentially 12 matches. But you can tell all the X's and, and things, and I signed it, so, so it's validated. I was a 50-50 booker. I'll get to that later, which is weird. But let's start off with the pre-show. I have no idea why they put this match on the pre-show. It blew my mind because minus the main event, this was... Oh, for the longest part of the show, the the match of the night. This was utterly amazing. I think I had the son as match of the night. Did I? Yeah, match of the night. Cat nap. I was spot on with this. But oh my gosh, if they would let these cruiserweights do what they do all the time. And put them on the main show. That would be thoroughly amazing. But WWE would have no problem selling out arenas. But right now, even I can still get Emway center seats. Granted, it is the hobo section up there towards the ceiling. There's still 20 bucks. There's like still 100 seats open. And that's just the one section. So, means this guy, Hobo Tom, going to a Monday Night Raw soon. 
but this is so amazing. The one thing I love about the Cruiserweight, there's so much transitional wrestling, a lot of chain wrestling. I love me some technical chain wrestling matches. If you do that, like this match was nothing but but um, chain spot reversal, spot reversal, spot reversal, spot reversal, spot reversal. It was awesome. Again, and it also showcased a little bit of the the wrestler's personality. But he he's from Australia. He's a brawler. Very good technical brawler. But again, for the most part, he's a brawler who knows some really good wrestling moves and is able to chain wrestle and do transitional wrestling. He's amazing. I wonder why he left NXT. Probably leave this too. Leave her to Hobo Tom. But that being said, it's my own little shot there. But again, so fast paced. Cedric Alexander is amazing. The things that man can do, I mean, this, this would be a truly dream match. But you have Leo Rush versus Ricochet versus Cedric Alexander. Tell me that's not high on the card at WrestleMania. I mean, that would be amazing. People go see that match alone. It was so good. Again, reversals and false finishes throughout this match. It was a fast-paced match. I think they gave it a decent amount of time, probably about 15, 20 minutes. I always get thrown off the timing of pay-per-view events because they do do so much for their entrances. But this match was freaking amazing, and it was on the kickoff show. What are you thinking, WWE? You don't put this match on the kickoff show because no one watches that. Well, a few hobos watch it because it's free. But this is a money main. This is this is a near money main event or a main event money match. And this is on the kickoff show. W what are you thinking? Because this honestly was a flaming yawn match. This match was amazing. And it was the first show. Generally, and, and I've talked to others who know more about the industry that, that, than obviously I do, but you want to have a good, solid match on, but you don't want to have like the match of the night on first. What are the other matches going to be like? Are they going to be this amazing? This is WWE. Eh, eh. So... Again, it was, uh, trust me, I take nothing away from Cedric Alexander or Buddy Murphy. They are just the victims to a whole bunch of bookers making just timing decisions that are wrong. Again, it was still a flaming young match. That was an amazing start. However, it had to be followed up and by Bobby Lashley versus Elias for a, a guitar on a a, a ladder match for a guitar. This match, after following up that match, was nothing. Elias is still good. Um, Elias again, he can put on a good match. Bobby Lashley's still very good. Don't I, I don't want to take away from Elias and Bobby Lashley, but after what you saw, you're like, this is eh. Um, you see. Leah Rush getting involved again in his ladders match with the DQ match. <laughs> Elias whipped Leo Rush into the ropes. Leo Rush just went under the ladder. That was that was that was great. Um, also, some other there were some pretty good spots. There was a one spot. I don't know if it was planned, but. Lashley did a move or just punt or just threw Elias into a ladder. Elias did the sell. He he, 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 fell, he, he fell forward holding his back. And then the ladder, I think it was spontaneously just fell on him. <laughs> he got hit twice with the ladder. It was good. 
it's, it's, it looked kind of fluky, but still, it's a ladder smash. Things happen. And it gives it that kind of edge of realism. So you're like, wow, this is pretty good. Um, Leo got tossed around, too. I mean, that's great. Elias, I guess Leo Rush is so small, Elias is so much stronger, you can just toss him around. But the thing was, and I know it was the first one that, I know, in theory, it was the first one to get the guitar wins, but that's it. I mean, it should be, you have to get the guitar and use the guitar, and then you win. But Elias eventually did incapacitate Lashley enough to go up the ladder, get the guitar, and the match was over? It just seemed very anticlimactic. And then, of course, Bobby Lashley took the guitar from Elias. And he hit him over the head with the guitar. I forget the exact sequence. This was in the pre-show. I was kind of doing stuff, but I know it was. Leo Rush hit a frog splash. Bobby Lashley did the, the almighty move and then hit him over the head with the guitar. And that was it. It was a fun enough match, but after what you saw to begin out to begin with, it was good. This is a ham sandwich match. But nevertheless, Elias did win. And it was an amazing Becky promo. Again, just a lot of promos, a lot of talking. It just seems, the pre-show seems, the kickoff show seems so long. At least for WrestleMania kickoff shows, they start off with some announcing, they introduce the announcers, and then, and then the rest. I mean, granted, they have I went they had the cruiserweight match between Neville and Austin Aries. Then they had the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. So it, it took up more time. It's just not talking. Yep, 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 yep. It was okay. Then, of course, TLC, the main card started. And it didn't start off great, I'll be honest. Um, you had Car Carmella and R Truth, a fabulous truth, versus Alicia Mahal. Of course, that's Alicia Fox and Jinder Mahal. And it was okay. Um, they did their signature dance break, and, and the Sings started to dance with them. And Car Carmella just like kicked them. I mean, Carmella's beating up the Sing brothers. It's okay. I have no idea why they're taking part of the, of, the, of the dance break, though. I'm kind of getting over the dance break. It was fun when it was spontaneous. But now you kind of expect it, so you're like, okay, when does the dance break happen? So it's not as entertaining as it was. It's still somewhat good. And hey, you know what? Carmella and R-Truth are getting on TV. Good for them. And then, then, oh my, it was Carmella and Car Carmella and Alicia Fox. They're, I didn't realize how good Carmella got. I mean, granted, I remember her. She was always okay as a wrestler. And she was the valet for Enzo, the two unmentionables, Enzo Amore and Big... Colin, big Colin Cassidy in NXT, and, and she was fun then. I don't remember her as really wrestling in NXT a lot, so it's hard to say. She's always seemed like a good wrestler, never a great wrestler, but she's really improved. And Alicia Fox is that really steady worker, which I can appreciate. Again, Alicia Fox is actually out of Ponte Vedra, Florida. I've never seen her. Maybe I have. Probably doesn't associate with hobos. But a uh, fox gets into the ring wearing wearing the captain's hat, and God bless our truth. He took the captain's hat from her. He looked like a total goofball, 
And Alicia Fox just... Shanti. So it was fun. That was a fun match. It was a fun, okay match. Again, this was not the match I was looking forward to. Uh, the things are just there just to get abused now. Uh, eventually, Carmella did hit the code of silence on Alicia Fox. I don't I think when R Truth and Jenner got into it, it was, it was okay. It's just really back and forth stuff. But Carmel, but Carmella did get Alicia Fox into the code of silence. It was weird because Alicia Fox tapped out really quick. And overall, this this I don't know, it just was lacking something. It was it was a can of soup. I mean, I don't know, it just lacked something. And then they went on to the interview because now both Carmella and our truth uh, are going to be the number 30 participants for their respective Royal Rumbles. Our truth somehow is going to screw this up. He might show up to the Women's Royal Rumble at spot number 30 instead of Carmella. Cost Carmella the spot. Carmella's not winning the Women's Royal Rumble. Our truth is not winning the Men's Royal Rumble. I guess, like, the only anticipation is who's going to be number 29. Because sometimes number 30, you're like, oh, who's number 30? Who's it going to be? Is it going to be this guy? Is it going to be that guy? Oh, wait, it's going to be our truth. I need a drink. That's that's what it comes down to. So it was okay. And then again, the interviews saying, no, we're not going to go there. No, because again, you do get a vacation. We're going to go to WWE headquarters in Sanford, Connecticut. During the wintertime. Instead of like the tropics. Or like Rio de Janeiro or Australia. Our truth isn't all with it there, at least character wise. Then we had our second match, which was a vast improvement, but it still, I, I don't know, it just seemed underwhelming. And I think we had the stigma of that very first match. Again, you start with the Flaming Young match. You start off up here, there's only one way to go, folks. Ooh, down. So we have the Usos versus the Bar. The Usos again, Jimmy and Jay Uso versus the Bars of Caesar of Cesaro and Sheamus versus the New Day. And representing the New Day was Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods, which is a good switch up. Cesaro's oh, amazing. I know they're all athletes there, but Cesaro for his size. Can he has some, some jump. I mean, he has, and I know they've said this, I think he's one of the most athletic people in the WWE. I mean, he's just amazing. The Usos, however, truly understand tag team wrestling and, and the way tag teams interact in the ring. The New Day is the New Day. They do, they do have their double team spots, but you can, and it's probably that thing, again, being twins and brothers. They, the Usos always seem really to be on the same page. There's no, okay, you're going to do this. They just do it. I mean, that just might be me. Again, there were other teams like the Steiner Brothers. Uh, Harlem Heat had that interaction. Any kind of brother tag teams or family-related, like the Hart Foundation, the British Bulldogs, they have that. It's not scientific, but it's that, that instinct. They, they know what the other person is going to do. I mean, just like if... I mean, Arn and Ole Anderson had it as a Minnesota Wrecking Crew. Arn and Tully Blanchard always just seemed a quarter step behind. 
again, being part of the Four Horsemen really does do things. Being part of a stable or faction does help you in that regard. But it was okay. Um, Zara seemed to be the one person taking the, the main beating of it, of the whole match. I, Sheamus was in there a few times. Then it became just a super kick party with the Usos. And, and that was fun. Um, Kofi got caught in the Cesaro swing where he just uh, went to the sharpshooter, which was really good. Yeah, the double stomp. <laughs> and then the trouble of paradise. And like, oh, there's Sheamus. And eventually the bar eventually did go over. And they retained the titles. This was a fun match. I really have no great complaints about it. This was a good cheeseburger match. Wow, this video is going to be a little on the long side. But again, this was a pretty big card. Um, I think they had the two matches. Really, Carmel, the mix, Mixed Match Challenge match, the Tag Team match, like within like half an hour. Then you have the Baron Corbin versus Braun Strowman match with Heath Slater as the referee. Um, Baron said, well, since Braun can't make it, Heath start the 10 count. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. Braun! And Braun music hits at the seven. Again, arm the sling. And then he cuts a promo on Baron Corbin. And then everyone seems to come to want to help Braun Strowman all of a sudden. Apollo, because it's, it's a no DQ match. I forget what kind of match it was, but it's a no DQ match. Apollo Crews comes on with the chair. Rude and Gay will come down with a chair. And you're thinking, like, is this going to be the entire face locker room showing up? It almost was. Finn Balor came down with a chair. Baron Corbin says, eh, 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 I'm not, I'm not having enough. I'm not, not this. I'm, I'm going to go take a yes. But, eh, eh. Kurt Angle comes down with a chair. And then it's just a, just a beatdown. And Baron Cor a one arm Baron Corbin still manages to pin, or a one arm. I'm sorry, Braun Strowman managed to pin Baron Corbin. Baron Corbin is no longer connected on GM. I guess it'll probably be Kurt Angle. Mm, what can you say other than it was a beatdown with, with like guys with chairs? Again, it was fun only because Baron. Cor because Braun Strowman came back. But overall, this was like not even a squash beating. This was actually a piece of toast. Which is the lowest rating that I could give anything. Then the next match, you have Ruby Riot versus Natalia. <laughs> oh boy. Um, what can I say about this match? It's good. I mean, Ruby Riot and Natalia are both very competent wrestlers, so don't get me wrong. Uh, some of the antics involved are okay. Some of them took away from the match. You were more focused on other aspects of the match besides the wrestling. Again, I, I know that's pro wrestling, but it just didn't feel right. It felt forced, I guess is the world word I'm looking for. It wasn't organic. It was a very generic wrestling match. They could have had this on Raw, and it probably would have been better on Raw. Not on a major pay-per-view. As again, Ruby Riot comes out with the Riot Squad. Natalia's in the ring. And Ruby Riot comes out with the right squad, and they're carrying, of course, the table with Jim Neidhart on it. Um, and, and you knew the other members of the right squad were going to go through the table. Even though I wanted Ruby Riot to win, they still could have done that. Nat um, Natalia eventually wins. I'll get to that. Um, Liv is the first to go through a table. Then Sarah Logan goes through a table. I mean, it, was a, it wasn't a bad match. It was just, I don't know. 
very generic. Um, Ruby did do one very creative thing. I'll, I'll give her this much. She's a very good ring general in the fact that when she got stuck in the sharpshooter, she didn't try to crawl to the ring, but she hit one of the tables set up in such a way where it fell on Natalia. And that looked really good. And then, again, all the other silly props came out. I wasn't a big fan of putting Nightheart on a table. Or his picture on a table. That, that was that was okay. And I understood it for Raw. But then Natalia picked out a table that had a Ruby Riot on it. I guess that's the end of this feud. Gee, I remember when the WWE used to have like year, two years, like 16 month feuds. They managed to tell this whole story partially in about a month, month and a half. Just seems too short for a bl bluff like this. And then um, she also, uh, Natalia. Also pulled out her father's jacket, put that on. So Jim the Animal Lantern's jacket came out. And after that, I'm like, oh, okay, you have to tranquila. I understand it's your father and your father's stuff. And guys, I still use a lot of my grandfather's stuff. I still have, I still use uh, my grandfather's fishing reels and stuff. But I think one broke. And granted, there was some sentimental value to it, but I'm like, it's a fishing reel. I can go to a new one. I you know those probably look like the Nightheart's glasses. I don't think Natalia would ever bring her father's sunglasses to the ring. Because you know what happens then. Um, so again, eventually, um, Natalia did powerbomb Ruby right through the table. It just seemed like a generic smack, like generic raw match. And I know it's a feel good moment for Natalia, but this is just like a ham sandwich match. Then things picked up a little bit. Ooh, picked up a lot. Because then you have Drew McIntyre versus Finn Balor. Again, it was this whole match just went by quickly, I think. Each match was only about fifteen minutes long. But it wasn't the twenty long slog that Ring of Honor was, even though some matches do deserve they do need and deserve that 20, 30 minute, uh, 20, 30 minutes time frame. Ring of Honor matches, and I know there were a few of them, but they seem like some of the matches just went on too long. When I saw this, I'm like, either this pay per view is going to last forever, or these are going to be some darn quick matches. They got the order wrong, but the timing right, though, I think. Because all the matches. Felt well paced for the most part. Um, it didn't seem too long or too short. Again, with the ex with, with a few exceptions, the Baron Corbin, Braun Strowman one I knew was like three or five minutes at most after they made the introductions. But all the other matches seemed about right. So you have a Drew McIntyre versus Finn Balor, and I thought Finn would come out as a demon. He didn't. And that, it kind of left me a little disappointed. Again, Drew Drew McIntyre is is more of the brute. Um, Finn is the more finesse guy. He had that DDT, and you know what? Drew McIntyre is an animal because he's a he's a truly great wrestler because he sold that DDT in a way that no one else could. And it it just seems so smooth and so realistic. Drew's Good. Again, Finn again does the faster pace. It was a good match. It seems, uh, this match actually seemed like a raw main event match. Um, I don't know how Finn's neck isn't broken though, or how he didn't re-injure that shoulder because he does. Uh, Drew 
does that white noise with the Celtic cross from the second rope and just drops Finn like on the this upper back, lower neck. Ooh, that just looks vicious. Then, then once Drew mocked Finn, it's like, oh, oh okay, Finn's winning. Um, Dolph Ziggler did show up. Uh, he didn't hit the super kick, but that was enough of a distraction for Drew McIntyre for Finn to get the advantage, and Finn Balor won. Again, it was a good match. It, this did, this did feel better than the other match. It felt felt more like a Raw main event match, which is saying a, a, a little bit. I mean, instead of being a ham sandwich, this is a good cheeseburger match. Then things really pick up. Um, you have Randy Orton versus Rey Mysterio Jr. in a chairs match. Oh, they just went to town on each other. This is what a chairs match should be. There's very few good chairs match. This is one of them. Um, who else was part of not a good chairs match? I want to say it was Aaron Corbin. Any match Edge was in was a good chairs match. I mean, they just they just seemed like they wanted to be hit by chairs. Yes, there were some wrestling moves. But a lot of those wrestling moves also had chairs involved, and it made the chair not just a weapon, but it made it part of the move, and they were creative with it. If you're creative with an inanimate object, that's going to be good. So with this match, again, Randy Orton's just amazing. Heel Randy Orton is the best Randy Orton. I mean, oh, he's just so vicious with the chair shots. He also has that deliberateness about it, which is what I can appreciate. Mysterio's awesome. I mean, he's just so creative in the ring. He did that baseball slide, except for when he, not when he was sliding, but as he was falling, he managed to put the chair between his body and right before he fell on Horton. And you're just like, I've never seen anyone do that before. And if you're going to be original and creative like that, that's that's awesome. I I oh, and then Orton's viciousness when it comes to the chairs, putting chairs on the table, and then backdropping Mysterio onto the chair that's on the table. Again, the creativeness involved was so good, and I think I like the fact that. The, the finisher was quick. I had Randy Orton sitting in a chair, and I kind of blinked and looked away. I think my cat came in the room, and I kind of missed the true finish. But again, if you're going to be creative and different and do new things, you are going to get a surf and turf rating, my friend. So now things are picking back up for TLC. So again, it started up way here. Let's see here. There we go. So it started way here. Went right like that. And it's scary. Kind of scary because it could keep on going down. But it actually turned things around and worked its way back up. It's always good to see. So... It, Granted, it was like a roller coaster because you're like, okay, this this is getting this could be very, very, very long. And do I already really watch this whole show? Especially after I saw Ring of Honor when they kind of trolled WWE for their uh, TLC matches, but it wasn't. Um, then we have Ronda Rousey versus Nia Jax, and this was a pretty good match. Um. It starts off Ronda just jamming away at Nia Jax. Obviously, she she knows what she's doing. She's she's learning how how to how to pull her punches a little bit. But again, it showed Ronda Rousey's going. Um, her one weakness in wrestling is that whenever she doesn't know the the move or know what to do next in a wrestling match, she goes back to her MMA background, which is good for now. It might get a little bit old, 
especially if you take something more experienced. Rust. So again, um, Nia Jax just showed how powerful he was. Uh, a couple set out power bombs um, from an armbar attempt. That, that was pretty good. Graves is, this is just funny on the mic. Uh, again, just uh, Nia Jax was being more vicious, going after the arms. Nia Jax was actually probably the better wrestler in this match. Um, Ronda Rousey does know the MME and all the submissions and, and strikes. But as far as wrestling goes, Nia Jax was actually pretty solid in this match. I mean, she's using the rim post. Again, she's a heel. She's supposed to use things like that. Do you want to see someone go Yano and just take off all the, all the turnbuckle pads? That's my own. That's that's my own little goofball thing. And Nia Jax looked like she had a new outlet, new outfit. Um, again, Nia Jax is just too big compared to Ronda Rousey, who in and 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 I'll say this in MMA they do have weight classes. So Nia Jax would be actually above her weight. And again, it was just hard for Ronda Rousey to do things to Nia Jax that she did on people more in, in her own weight class, whatever that, whatever that is. Let's just say Nia Jax is 170 pounds. Ronda Rousey is 110, 115 that's that's still a pretty big sixty pounds is a pretty big difference. I want to say most MMA motions don't vary. I think every twenty pound, every maybe ten fifteen pounds is a new weight division. So you're not facing anyone who's really outside of your weight besides like super heavyweight or I think they have like un, uh, like um, like unlimited heavyweight. That's just a, that's a weird. Thing. I mean, everything else is within 10, 15 pounds of each other. It might be closer to ten. I think they have that half pound weight allowance. So if you weighed in at one twenty five, or if you were supposed to make weight at one twenty five, wh whatever that class is, you could be one twenty five and a half, and they're like, okay, you're good. But again, that, that one pound, they're like, uh-uh. So, so again, it showed Ronda Rousey kind of fighting out of, uh, um, f fighting out of her class. Um, Rousey makes, makes it up, but, but, and she's getting better. And she's l really learning how to wrestle. Like she did a, had a Superman punch after she jumped off Nia Jax's thigh, which is smart. But that's Simone Headbutt. Ronda Rousey has to learn. That Simone Headbutt has put many a person out. And Nia's getting pretty good. She, she actually climbed up to the top rope. Probably big mistake if you don't know what you're doing up there. So then um, she got caught by Ronda Rousey. So, uh, Tamina does get involved a little bit. And Ronda Rousey actually looked a little bit better. They changed her makeup a little bit, I think. I know she was wearing red and black this time versus more of the plaid and white. She, she looked better. I, I know her makeup before was... Uh, Again, this was, it was an okay match. It wasn't bad. It wasn't terrific. I think this was my Stone Cold Lock of the Night. Ronda Rousey did win. Uh, she made Nia Jax tap out, I think, to the armbar eventually. Kind of what she expected. It's a ham sandwich match. And I was, again, this, this kind of also shocked me here at the end. Because what happened, I didn't see this happening, but it makes me feel bad a little bit because they're treating the WWE Championship like a garbage title. Because then you had Daniel Bryan versus AJ Styles. Trust me, these two could do no wrong in the ring. Um, it was a fun match. I mean, Daniel Bryan does true heel tactics. Uh, whenever he had AJ pinned in a corner, 
or had like a choke. He weighed the whole. The ref, the ref gives you a five count. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, break it or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to DQ you. And sometimes if you keep on doing that, okay, five. You're ding, 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 bells over. That's the finish, baby. It's a DQ. Daniel Bryant has true has true knowledge of wrestling because he because he takes advantage of that ref's five count. He knows he has five seconds, so he waits until until count four and then just backs off, releases. Hey, I did what you told me to do. I, I would let go of four. Okay, okay. Puts the cherry back on. Okay, one, two, three, four. Hit. I'm good. So again, he knows how to do that. Um, he does all. He knows all submissions, the bow and arrow stretch. AJ Styles looked like he was having an injury, and I know we probably won't see AJ Styles for a while. I think he does. And listen, AJ Styles deserved a little break. He's been wrestling really for the most part one whole year. And I'm sure that takes a toll. So I'm sure AJ Styles needs a little break, and he probably is sore. Again, Styles does have his comeback. And, oh, this was a good match. It was a long match. They gave this the right amount of time. I want to say this was the longest match of the card, probably 20-plus minutes. But it didn't feel too long, though, which is good. Again, these two really know how to pace each other. They know how to pace. They know how to set a wrestling pace. And they're really good at telling the in-ring story. And it was, again, a fun match. AJ Styles could have a three-star match with Mop. I could even give AJ Styles probably a four star match. Well, maybe a three star, maybe a three and a half star match. Be a little bit better than the mop, I think. Again, he does have his comeback. Um, this time, though, Daniel Bryan hits that final big leg kick, though, which he's been missing the past few times. Again, both they had reversals and counters for each other's finishers, signatures. And eventually, it was a roll up victory. By Daniel Bryan that got him the win. And really a darn good surf and turf quality match. It was what you really come to expect from these two. So again, it was really darn good. And oh, sorry about that. Got a little thirsty there. Then, again, my only complaint is that these two matches probably should have been switched because they're making the IC title feel more important than the WWE Championship, which, I don't know. It doesn't If you're the WWE Champion, I can see why they had the main event as it was for the, for the SmackDown Women's Championship. I get that. That's, that's the woman's belt, and this, and this is really a big money feud. But you should really have the IC title go before the main belt. Then you had Seth Rollins versus Dean Ambrose. Dean Ambrose come out to the air race sign, which actually I like. It's a little different. Um, shows that he's a heel. I don't mind it that much. Now, Seth Rollins burn, repeated burn it down. Eh, it's okay. This was a really fast start, though. And, and Ambrose is definitely has that heel moveset. Um, Seth eventually just... Uh, stares at Dean on the outside. There was a lot of back and forth between the two. The thing that really made this match great was the jawing between the two of them. That just, if you have two wrestlers who know how to trash talk and they probably go through the whole backstage, hey, I'm going to say this, this is okay. Oh, pff, you, you say whatever, that's, that's great. Like, you mind if I say this, this, oh, dude, whatever. So the fact that they were able to, to jaw at each other back and forth in the match. It added a little bit extra to that match, I think, versus wrestlers that just go there and just wrestle. They trust me. Some wrestlers can put on an amazing match and not say anything to each other, but if you can draw back and forth with your opponent, it's just so good. I mean, the trash talking, the moves they were pulling out. I think the only thing maybe that would have made this match better is if because Dean Ambrose did win. Uh, Seth Rollins tried to pin him with a, a Falcon's Arrow. It would be neat to see Seth pull out the pedigree. Again, just really for big matches like this one, where you have to really go deep into your bag of tricks. 
AJ Styles done that. He has like <laughs> four or five signatures finishers. He has the phenomenal form he's finished people with. He has a Styles Clash. He has a calf cutter. He has a 450 splash. So he has so he's four things he can finish you with. That I know of. He probably has more up in here. But again, if Seth Rollins pulled out the pedigree, that, that really would have made the match. And even if he teased the pedigree, that still would be awesome. And, and Dean could have reversed it. It's just a back body drop. But Dean hit the Dirty Deeds with a little extra stank, it looked like. Good for Dean Ambrose. Um, the only thing that was kind of annoying with this is that Corey Graves would go on to Badger Renee Young about their relationship and think she was that or, or, or she's a tremendous actress because she just seemed to get really annoyed by that. And you could really tell that by her voice. She's like, okay, we're done on this line of questioning. Get back to your job, freaking loser. But again, this was a fun, good match. Again, it started up, started up here. Went down, 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 down. Oh, and finally, and came back really up again. So it was, again, it was a good card. Again, this was a surf and turf match. And then in the main event of the evening, you have the challenger from Charlotte, North Carolina. She is the one and only woo, daughter of the nature boy. She is Charlotte Flair. And the second challenger, hailing from Osaka, Japan. She is the Empress of Tomorrow. She is Asuka. And the champion from Dublin, Ireland, the man, Becky Lynch. This was an amazing match. And there was trash talking by Becky and Charlotte back and forth. I don't think Asuka said much. If she did, it was in Japanese. It was probably awesome, too. Um, Asuka was the first to get the ladders. Then Charlotte gets the ladder. And then the tables are set up. Once tables and ladders are involved, chaos ensues. So Charlotte eventually goes to the table. And that looked like a rough bump. Because you could hear Charlotte say something she wasn't supposed to say on TV. And I think she actually did something to her ribs, maybe. But we'll hear about that probably tomorrow in the next couple of days. And then Asuka. Asuka, oh. we're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. She has had that evil smile. And on Asuka, it looks so good. This is NXT Asuka. This is prime NXT Asuka. Um, Becky then goes at Charlotte. <laughs> With chair shots. <laughs> and then it's just chair shots for everyone. Um... <laughs> Then you feel bad about the poor German announce table. It's like, whatever happened to the Spanish announce table? I guess they're spreading the love to all the countries. Um, because Charlotte got stuck on the table, and Becky was did a leg drop, but Char but Oscar was smart. She rolled off that table. So now you're thinking, ooh, might Oscar actually win? But then, of course, kendo sticks come out. Charlotte just starts beating up both of them with kendo sticks. Um, Becky gives chase a little bit. She gets she gets said kendo stick. And, well, actually, Asuka goes up the ladder. Becky gives chase. 
This is mine. Get off my title. It's mine. I love it. And then I have no idea how Charlotte Flair is even functioning after going through all those tables and all those shots. Then there was some nasty barricade spot where I don't know if the barricade was stuck like that or if it was not necessarily planned to be a barricade spot but became one. Because, ooh, that was another Uchi moment. <laughs> and Charlotte put Becky through a table. And then, what happened? Ronda Rousey shows up as Charlotte and Becky are on the ladder. And Ronda just shoves that ladder down. So there's only one ladder left. And guess who's on it? Asuka. Asuka wins the title. And really an amazing match because the crowd was hot on this. They were saying, this is awesome. They started out, Becky, Becky. It was a fast-paced match throughout. You're going to have to do this WWE. This match gets a filet mignon every day of the week. And that was TLC. It was an uh, odd pay-per-view. Not, re not really a bad pay-per-view. I thought it was going to be awful, actually. I had so low expectations, with the exception of a few matches, especially after seeing Ring of Honor and how they kind of trolled TLC. But this this was different. This was amazing, though. This shows that when WWE really wants to put out a good product, they still can. They just, it's like they choose not to. And I don't understand that. But, again, I was a 50-50 booker tonight. So I got half my matches right. That was pretty good. Um, That was the last pay-per-view of the WWE season for this year, 2018. Look for me live streaming the next WWE pay-per-view. So now I know the WWE says, eh, eh, you cannot do a whole laundry list of stuff. And I've kind of learned my lesson. I'd kind of like to thank everyone for watching. Again, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Uh, a little bit about this week. Monday is going to be the typical Raw. Raw show. Tuesday is going to be the typical SmackDown show. On Thursday, there is a Tribute to the Troops special. And then I think the WWE goes into the best of next week. So you'll have at least one special show. I'm putting together that card right now for my Christmas Day matches. Again, because here at the Daytona Bum Fight League, Daytona Beach Bum Fight League, we don't have Christmas. They take it back to work. You stinking hobo. And probably tomorrow, also tomorrow, you're going to hear the hobo song. And then probably on Tuesday, you'll hear the 12 Days of Hoboing. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Again, feel free to agree or disagree with me. But for the most part, TLC was actually a really fun pay-per-view. The, the bad matches, they, they were bad. But the good matches, they were really good. So it kind of all balances out at the end. And thank you for watching, guys. And um, well, I'll say, say Merry Christmas for later. But I shall see everyone Monday. Have a good night. Bye.